Good morning. It is an honor to be speaking here at the PFS meeting 2021. Um, and my subject is the body as a capital good. And this is a very uh, important economic issue and, and asset, ultimately, the human body. And it hasn't had a proper role in economic theory for reasons we're going to explore today. And um, there have been theoretical, both theoretical and historical reasons for this, um, of course, omission. So the, the subtitle is how land, labor, and capital left out our own vehicle in the world. So human action, is it for ghosts? And uh, it, this, this may be ridiculous or just theoretical stretches of different sorts, but we have articles and we have books on the economics of uh, vampires and zombie, well, zombies. Um, so whether we, we consider these interesting you know, thought exercises or, or actually productive in the realm of, of economics, it seems that the uh, analysis of human action itself has been uh, deprived of, the, of its vehicle, the, the human body. So basically we have been doing economics for ghosts, and I'm, I'm going to try to explain why I consider this so. Um, as you can see, you have uh, the economics of vampires, an agent-based perspective. Uh, you have economics of, of the undead, a full book on zombies, vampires, and the dismal science by several authors, and part of this uh, podcast, Free Economics, you, you, you find what can vampires teach us about economics, etc. But uh, as you can see, and, and you will see after this talk, hopefully, um, even Austrian economics is not uh, too far away from this since we are dealing with the economics of ghosts to some degree. So why has the body been missing? And let's here delve into the theoretical reasons. Uh, first of all, we have the British classical economists or so-called classical economists. And the problem is that um, the common practice, uh, this is according to Adam Smith, the common practice of farmers has misled the physiocrats and to some extent the, the, uh, Adam Smith himself not to include land in their notion of capital. In those days, farmers very often did not estimate the monetary value of their land and therefore land did not constitute capital for them. So basically, there was no good reason in general to include land as capital. And this leads us directly to something that w may sound like a sacrilege to some of us, uh, which is the idea that von Baberg was not a direct continuator of uh, Karl Menger's work on capital, but rather that um, Karl Menger, um, this is 17 years after the publication of his Principles of Political Economy or Principles of Economics, as it has been translated to English as the title, um, 17 years later, in 1888, he basically recanted or um, clarified what he meant about capital. And um, he, basically, um, he, he basically criticized several uses of the word capital in the microsphere that are very re relevant to us today. So, for example, um, Karl Menger attacked um, the use of capital as any, uh, basically as any uh, wealth dedicated to the acquisition of income. Like, that was too broad of a generalization because, of course, there is psychic income in the, in the Austrian school, not only material income, so this is too broad. We cannot uh, say that an armchair, because it gives us psychic income, it's capital in any sense. Um, and, and Menger explained this in his famous work, in the, well, not so famous work in 1888, um, as something to do with the etymology of words. Etymologically, I'm quoting Menger here, the word capital indeed traces back to caput, the head or main good, as against its utilizations, its fruits, etc. Yet, Menger considers it at the formation of the theory of capital income and income to call an armchair capital because its ownership allows, allows us to have a siesta and to call the relaxation it affords income. This is, this is Menger himself. So 
such categorization, he argued, is of no help in the theory of the different uh, resources and fields of income. But what about proper investment with monetary outlays as well as income subject to economic calculation? Uh, apparently, Menger was onto something in, in that sense. We're going to arrive there. But another two senses in which he criticized the use of capital, and he even went on to say um, something very harsh about um, his student, Von Baberg. He, he has a very famous remark uh, to Schumpeter where he says something like, um, time will come when people will realize that Von Baberg's theory of capital and interest is one of the greatest errors ever committed. And those are very strong words from Karl Menger, especially because, and I mentioned the word sacrilege, we assume that from Menger we have von Baberg, and then we have Mises, and then we have you know, Hayek and Rothbard, preferably, and, and, and the whole tradition. But it, it turns out that uh, Menger was very critical of what happened with, with the concept. And the second way in, he, in which he attacked the the, um, what we now would call the Austrian standard view of capital, is that he was very critical of um, the idiosyncratic use of terms. So basically, um, he, he stated that science, at least, or, or least of all, a science like economics, which deals with phenomena of everyday life, has the right of, or to, arbitrarily redefine popular terms. And here, we're arriving to Menger's definition, which is, which is going to support us today to explore the body as a capital good. And, of course, the third definition that Menger um, basically attacked in 1888 uh, was the definition of capital as produced means of production or produced factors of production. Because he uh, brilliantly, quite characteristically of him, went on to explain that what is the true difference between some uh, parts of you know, land we may use in a, in, a, in a project or in a productive endeavor? And he also clearly, well, actually very specifically rejected the view that um, higher, th these goods of a higher order were to be considered capital per se. I, I mean, he, sa he, he clearly s says that they can be um, considered capital in a technical sense. We, we may even say uh, an engineering point of view. But again, that's not the view of capital that uh, what he, he would set forth as his positive, positive theory of capital 17 years after his principles of economics. So that's, that's a problem. And so we can see with the British classical economists, land was nowhere to be found because it was not a co common practice to appraise land and to engage in monetary calculation. And with von Bauer, we have uh, somewhat of a problem here. And as I, as I said, this is somewhat of a sacrilege um, to view Menger or the late Menger as a rival to, to, to his disciples' uh, view on capital and development of the whole theory. And quite troubling in some ways. And of course, why has the body been missing of economic analysis for historical reasons? It's because of slavery and totalitarian regimes of all sorts um, are only too close historically. So it's, it's, it's been a touchy subject. It's been a subject that lots of economists or most economists have been very weary of entering uh, into because it may sound like we're talking about uh, the buying and selling people, basically, and even though the libertarian position on the market for, for, for human organs is, is, is uh, positive, um, of course, the, the, even the analysis, the economic analysis of, of the body as a capital good has been um, something prohibited. So can the human body be a good? to begin with. And here, um, well, it is well known to the student of economic ideas that several goods that were not even considered goods until the force of events all but imposed their recognition of go as goods. For example, 
cultural and artistic activities as valid entrepreneurial, uh, and, you know, money-making activities. As we know, Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School, the most advanced in the European continental tradition of, uh, you know, subjectivism and purposeful uh, action, um, explained that good character requires four criteria to be met. A possible use or need for something, that the thing has characteristics that render it uh, of use to satisfy that need, knowledge of such characteristics, and enough control, physical control, or you know, control may, may, inquire, may require even legal control nowadays, um, of the thing to render it a good for human purposes. So as we can see, human ingenuity and intersections are behind good character in any and all cases. It is human action in the world that which determines good character, plus the classification of any good at any time among several taxonomies which we know. Scars versus non-scars, public versus private, production versus consumption good, inferior versus normal versus luxury good, etc. Now, think of it. If your shovel breaks down while you're digging a hole and you continue to dig the hole with your arm, whether it be for consumptive or productive ends, your arm is, at that moment, your tool, as the shovel was. So it clearly has good character. So why is it not mentioned at all? So it is important to keep in mind that the classification of a good is not an objective binary classification based on the phys physical chemical content of this resource. It is determined by subjective appraisals of the thing in question. Just as no object has intrinsic value or objective value, all value is subjective. It is not a quality present in an object, resource, or good. So what about capital? And here's where we go with Menger versus Menger and von Baber, Klagman, and all that development of capital theory. And of course, um, human actions in the world do not only generate goods, they can also generate bads. For example, let's think, of a, let's think of a bad tattoo. If you get a bad tattoo or one that ages badly over the years, it's not a good. In time, it may become a bad. And you may even want to pay to have it removed. The same, in the same way, we pay for trash to be removed from our lives. Um, what is happening nowadays? Do we have the same problems as the farmers not appraising their lands? Well, let's go again to this definition, the core of the problem. Physiocrats and to some extent Adam Smith didn't include land in their notion of capital because farmers very often did not estimate the monetary value of their land. That is why land did not constitute capital to them or for them. Instead, Smith, Ricardo Mill, and their followers left an artificial trichotomy of supposed land, capital, and labor. So is the body land? No, it's not. Is the body capital? Well, we're exploring that today. Uh, is the body labor? No, because labor is the action performed in the, in, the, in the external world by humans. So what do we have today? World figures. Lionel Messi, Heidi Klum, the famous model, and many artists, athletes, performers, and surgeons have already had insurance over body parts and their normal uh, functionality. If we lean on, even if not too heavily, on ethics, we find that the act of argumenting for and obtaining those services in the market render testimony to something explained by Hoppe's argument, argumentation ethics, which is that hiring a risk-pulling service, such as ins insurance, presupposes ownership over one's own body in such way that capital investment, amortization, and passive income of past achievements and brand deals are already a real-world category. And let me confess something here before we see a list of these artists and what body parts they, they have insured. I thought this, um, this topic was only one about markets being quicker and more dynamic than economic science to recognize um, you know, subjects and phenomena in the, in, the, in the real world. But it's not only that it's lagging, that economics is lagging behind markets as it, as it usually happens, but it's uh, also that 
beyond British um, and, and the British schools, the derivatives, uh, you know, you know, as neoclassical and uh, the Chicago School, etc., and even the Marxists who follow Ricardo, they are unequipped to deal with the body as a capital good, and also the Austrians, because of the work we have done on capital theory, instead of going back to Menger in a way, and I'm going to quote Menger in a in a little while, and you can see how late the late Menger opens up the path for this analysis. So what about today? This is a list of top musicians who have insured their body parts. You have Jeb Beck, Kid Richards, although I, we don't know why Kid Richards would need insurance over his body parts since he's apparently immortal. <laughs> Dolly Parton, <laughs> David Lee Roth, Tina Turner, Madonna, Kylie Minogue, Rihanna. We have this famous um, violin player, or of course pop violin player, has insurance of over one million over his fingers. Um, Gene Simmons from Keys in the middle has insurance over his tongue, because it's a very famous tongue in the, in the rock world. And of course, we have Keith Richards. And here I want to quote Menger himself when he defines capital. We already went through several critiques of what things are not capital for Menger. It's not produced. Uh, means of production, it's not anything or wealth that yields income, and of course it's not, um, it's not just tools in general. And as we said, Menger himself invited us to use terms as regular people use them, although which is kind of funny because um, Austrian authors have tend to be kind of somewhat idiosyncratic uh, or love to redefine terms. So under Karl Menger's definition of capital, capital is all assets of a business or whichever technical nature they may be insofar as their monetary value is the object of our economic calculations. In other words, when they calculatorily constitute so sums of money for us that are dedicated to the acquisition of income, which opens up the path for analyzing several things of capital. Even Menger himself in 1888 decries um, not only the, the British classical economists, but also von Baberg's uh, treatment of capital as the, the orders of goods and that technical or let, let's say entrepreneurial or productive analysis as not being the true economic analysis, which may include several things. And he mentions a banker, for example, what bankers lending their sum, a sum of money is not included in that analysis because money, uh, we, we cannot place money uh, properly in any of the, of, the, of the orders of goods. And of course, in the, it, not to mention in the British classical uh, schools, it's not land, it's not labor, so can it be capital? Even the, the, the funds for bankers do not fall into this categorization. So the recognition of this fact of human action in the world may allow us to further assess risk among activities. If we recognize that the human body can be a capital good, and of course, let's remember, let's keep in mind that even its good character depends on human action. It's not per se a good, and it's not per se a capital good. Um, we can further and better risk, uh, uh, assess risk among activities, organizations, and individuals and perhaps help restore the insurance industry from within. Because lots of activities uh, imply the use of the human body as a capital good. Also, recognizing the body as a capital good, where and when it applies, demolishes the quote-unquote sacrosanct dichotomy of land, labor, and capital from the British schools that leaves the individual, quite characteristically, of them Marxism included, as we said, since they are Ricardians, out of the analysis. And um, the thing is, this is just beginning. We're beginning to use the, the body as a recognizable investment vehicle. This, this is the beginning of an era of biotech, nanotech, uh, in general, biohacking. We're doing body enhancement, the models, 
and, and sports figures and surgeons already have insurance over their body parts. Um, this, is only, this is happening nowadays, and this is just beginning. What happens when we begin to enhan enhance ourselves, our intelligence, our memory, our other physical abilities with biotech? And basically, um, you know, we, we, some people are going to become cyborgs, or uh, I don't know, lots of people want, but all these investments are going to be money yielding. And this enters the broader categorization of Carl Menger uh, of anything as a potential capital uh, good, insofar as their monetary value is the object of our economic calculations. In other words, as Menger said, when they calculatorily constitute sums of money for us that are dedicated to, to the acquisition of income. So we know when athletes, for example, have 20 years to, to, to have a good run, and then they have to leave off the money they made of those most productive years, and that was, that was it, basically. Models age, um, and people in other professions, and even, even lesser trades or so-called lesser trades, are constantly depreciating their bodies in certain activities. And all, all this is going unrecognized because economics, the mainstream economics, but even Austrian economics, have been unequipped to deal with this phenomena. And finally, uh, I just want to finish with this. If your body can or is, can be or is a capital good, that surely includes mental well-being, and thus coming to a PFS meeting is an act of wellness and self-care. Thank you.